A break statement, as we've discussed, is a special statement that will end execution of the loop in which it's contained. It'll jump execution out of a loop. Like here, for example, in this main function, if we have this loop here, and this inner loop will normally iterate five times, that's what this counter variable arranges, and so it should call do something five times, but maybe upon some condition, we want to break out early instead of going through the full number of iterations of this inner loop. And so when this is true, the break statement executes and execution jumps out of this inner loop, the one in which the break statement is most directly contained. But be clear we don't jump out of the outer loop, so this outer loop will continue to execute. This raises the question, well, what if we want to break out of multiple loops? We could be in like four levels deep and we want to jump out of all four loops instead of just the, the inner one. Well, for that purpose, we can use what are called labels. Yeah, you put a label, which is an identifier followed by a colon. This here is a label. It precedes this for statement, this loop statement. And so on our break, if we specify the label Walter, then this break will jump out of not just the loop it's directly contained in, but the outer loop with the label Walter. So this break will effectively jump out of both loops. It'll jump out of two. Now, of course, Walter is generally not a very sensible label for a loop. Generally, whenever I can get away with it, I'll just call it loop. If I have nothing better to call the loop label. Of course, using such a generic name may induce a, a name collision where you might have a complicated function with multiple labels, uh, both of the same name. But these labels, they're, they're occasionally very useful, but they don't come up that often. So it's kind of rare to have uh, multiple labels. And, and in fact, I would say if I ever end up needing more than one label in a function and there's a name collision I need to avoid, I really wouldn't feel bad about just calling them like loop two and loop three because it's going to be really rare that you ever have more than a couple loop labels in any one function. Something we could do in GoPigeon is create variables of a function type, and that variable would then be a reference to a function such that you assign a function to it and then you invoke that reference as if it were a function, and that has the effect of calling the function with whatever the variable currently references. And so here we're creating a variable f, whose type is a function taking an int and a string as parameters and returning a boolean, and this is how we denote it in GoPigeon. You wrote fn and angle brackets, but here, here it looks basically just like the signature of a function when we define it, except there's no name of the function and you don't have names of the parameters. And so having defined this variable f, we can then assign foo to it because foo is a function which matches the signature. It has an int and string parameter in that order and it returns a boolean. And so if we invoke f like a function, f currently references foo. So this call here to f is the same as this call here to foo. Be clear though, and we saw this in GoPigeon, functions with different signatures have different types. So here, for example, foo and bar have different signatures or different type functions because they have the same parameter types in the same order but then foo returns a boolean and int and bar returns nothing. And so now, uh, having to find f to be a function taking an int and a string and returning a boolean and int, we can assign foo to it, that's valid, but if we assign bar to f, that's a compile error because bar is the wrong kind of function. Here in main, we have a cat variable c and another cat variable c2, and we have this variable f, whose type is a function taking a float32 and returning a float32. And this expression, c not eat, eat is a method of cat, but we're not calling the method. Instead, what this expression returns is a function. It returns the function, which is the method code. But it does so in a special way, because when you call a method, there's supposed to be a receiver. And so what f is being assigned is not just a reference to the method eat, but also to the value that's gonna be passed to the receiver, in this case, c here. So when we call f with the value 0 0.4, 0 0.4 is passed to food, to the float32 parameter, and this C is passed to the receiver of eat, also called C. And so we get back 15.6, because that's 15.2 uh, plus 0 0.4 gives us 15.6. But then when we take C2 and access the method eat without calling it, we get back again, again, the same method represented as a function, but now the implicit receiver, the bound receiver is C2, not C. And so when we call F in this case with the argument 0 0.4, that's this weight value, 8.4 plus 0 0.4, giving us 8.8. .8. So yes, we can treat methods like values, like we can with functions, um, but when we use the syntax, when we refer to the method, it is bound to the receiver. And when we access methods, much like when we call them, if, say, the method is expecting a pointer receiver, but our value is a non-pointer, well then, we could get the reference explicitly as we do here, or we could leave it implicit. We could just write C in this case, and it would be the same deal. And likewise, if the method were expecting a non-pointer, 
but we had a pointer, like say here the cat were a pointer, well then explicitly we could do the dereference like so, or we could just leave it implicit and it'll be done for us. So that's consistent with the implicit referencing and dereferencing which happens when we call methods. Now, sometimes you might want a reference to a method with no bound value. You want to get a reference to a function where you pass the receiver value explicitly. And you can get this with what are called method expressions. Uh, here, for example, say our cat has an eat method, again, taking a float32, but now we're turning an int. And we want to store a reference to this method in a variable where we have to pass in a cat explicitly. And the syntax for that looks like a method value, but in the method expression, the thing before the dot is the type name itself. So because eat is a method of cat, we write cat.eat. And that gets us back a function stored in foo here, which is expecting a cat as its first argument, then a float32, and then an int. So you get back a function where what is the receiver in the method is now the first parameter of the function. And then likewise here, we're assigning to bar a function which is the method eat, but the first parameter is a pointer to cat. And, and because the dot operator has a higher precedence than asterisk, we have to put the type name in parens for the syntax. And so now, uh, given some cat, if I want to call foo, it's expecting a, a non-pointer cat for, as its first argument, and, and then some float32 value. And when we call bar, it's expecting a pointer. And there's no magic here where non-pointers are automatically referenced and non-pointers automatically dereferenced. This is not a method call, it's a regular function call, and you have to be explicit about passing the right type of thing. So we get compilers down here when you try and call foo with a pointer to cat and bar with a non-pointer because they're expecting the opposites. Now, sometimes when working with functions, it would be convenient if instead of having to write the function as its own separate thing at the top level of code, as we do here and write the, the function foo, it'd be nice instead where that function is used, particularly if it's used in just one place, if you can just define the function in that one place. And we can do that with what's called an anonymous function. An anonymous function is a function which is written as an expression inside another function. And so here, this syntax, which looks exactly like a, a function that we defined outside, except it doesn't have any name. There's no name for this function, which is being created and then assigned to f. The syntax is otherwise just like a function definition, except it's considered an expression. It's a thing which returns a value. So in fact, if I put parentheses around the thing, that would still be valid, because you can take any expression and put parentheses around it without changing it. But we don't actually need the parentheses in this case, to be clear. And of course, in this case, we don't need to make the declaration of f and its first assignment separate. We can combine that into one statement, and we can, in fact, use the colon equals syntax. And so now we can get rid of this line, and that is equivalent. We're creating a variable f, assigning it this new function, this anonymous function. And this is a function which has a single parameter, which is an int, and it returns an int, and its body in these curly braces has a single statement. Understand that an anonymous function can have as many statements as you like, just like a top-level function. So we could put any number of statements in here, like say, pretty not high. One kind of scenario where anonymous functions come in handy is something like this, where we're dealing with this function process, which itself takes a function as one of its arguments. Process is a so-called higher order function because it takes in another function as argument. And what happens in this program is we create a variable x, which is a slice of ints with the values 3, 2, 4, negative 10, and 8. And we're calling process, passing in the slice of ints, x, and then also adder, which is this function defined here, which has the appropriate signature which process is expecting. It's expecting for its parameter f, a function taking an int and returning an int. And then what happens in process is we loop through all the ints in the slice of ints. And for each int, we are passing it to f, and the value returned, the int returned, we're then assigning in its place. So we're going through this slice of ints and overwriting that value with the result of feeding it through this function f. And in this case, the function we pass to process is called adder, which takes the value pass in and adds five. And then after calling process, if we print out the values of the slice, we get eight, two, that's a mistake. We should be adding five to it, so seven. So three plus five is eight, 2 plus 5 is 7, 4 plus 5 is 9, negative 10 plus 5 is negative 5, and 8 plus 5 is 13. So that code is all fine, except you might find it a bit bothersome if this function adder is not used anywhere else in code. If the only role of 
If the only place we're using adder in our program is to pass it here to process, it'd be nice if we could just create the function right here in the call. And that's what we can do with an anonymous function. This code here is entirely the same, except instead of having an adder function at the top level of code, instead we just wrote the function here as an anonymous function directly in the call to process. And it's a little tricky yeah, to get used to looking at the syntax because when you start putting anonymous functions in your code, and people prefer different styles about how exactly to format the code. This is how I would do it. So this is the call to process starting here. And here's the end paren closing that call. Here's the first argument, the slice x. And then here's the anonymous function, which we're passing to f. So that's one reason to use an anonymous function. It's sometimes more convenient and in some cases arguably makes the code look a little cleaner. Another reason to use anonymous functions is that an anonymous function has access to the local variables of the function call in which it is created. So here's say in this function main, main has four local variables, a, b, bar, and z, and bar is being assigned this anonymous function. And this anonymous function here, if it likes, can access the variables a and b, because a and b are local variables of the enclosing function that exist when this function itself is created. We can't access bar, we can't access z because they're declared down below. If we wanted to have access to them in the anonymous function, we'd have to declare them ahead of time before the function is created. Uh, but here we can access a and b. And so inside the anonymous function, it has its own local variable x declared here, and we're taking the value of x and adding a to it. But because this anonymous function doesn't have its own a, the a we're adding to is this a out here in the enclosing scope. If we gave the anonymous function its own a variable like here, well then if we use the, the name a inside the anonymous function, it would refer to this one, the one that which belongs to the function itself. But if we remove that name collision, now we can access the variable a of the enclosing function. And so down here, when we call bar, it's adding x to the value a, and we get back five, because the current value of a at the time of this call to bar is three. And in fact, if we were now to modify this to say seven, uh, and then call bar again. Well, now when bar is called, the variable a, which this function refers to, now is the value seven, and we add two to it, so this would get us back nine. So be very clear, anonymous functions have access to not just the values of the variables at the time the function is created, it has access to the variables themselves. When this anonymous function was created, a had the value three, but subsequently when we modified the value of a, that change was reflected in bar because bar is referring to the actual variable a, not just its value. And in fact, inside anonymous functions, we can even modify the value of outer variables. So here we're gonna just take a and increment it by three. And so now here, we'll get rid of this assignment. Now in this first call to bar, the value of a is incremented from three to six, add two to that, we get eight. And then when we call bar again, the value of a is incremented from six to nine, add two, and we get 11. So an anonymous function can both read and modify the local variables of functions which enclose it. This phenomenon where an anonymous function retains access to local variables of the function or functions which enclose it, this is called closure. And I say functions plural because it's possible that our anonymous function could be inside another anonymous function, which is inside another anonymous function. You can have more than one level deep of nested functions, and an anonymous function can see the variables of all the functions which enclose it. So if you have an anonymous function of five levels deep, that innermost uh, nested function can see all four of the enclosing scopes above it, etc. Anyway, the very important thing to understand about these closures is that those retained variables are particular to a certain call. So to demonstrate, here we have this function foo, which is returning a function, taking nothing and returning an int. That's what this means, this is the name of the function. Here's its parameters, it takes nothing in, and it's returning a function which itself takes nothing and returns an int. And inside this function foo, we have a variable a, which is an int variable with the value two. And what the function returns is here this anonymous function which is taking a of the enclosing scope and incrementing this value by three and then returning that value. And so every time foo is called, we get back a function which has closure over the, the local variable a of that call. Separate calls to foo have their own local variable a. So the function returned every time 
has the same code, and that sense is the same function, but they're different closures. They have, they have different retained variables A. So down here in main, we have variables X and Y, which store a function taking nothing and returning an int. And we're calling foo twice. And the first time we call foo, we store that in X. The second time we call foo, we, we store the returned function in Y. Both X and Y are referencing functions with the same code that do the same thing, except they have different closures. They have different variables A, which they're retaining. And so, if I call x the first time, it's returning the value of a after incrementing it by 3. So it starts out with value 2, and the first time we call x, 2 is incremented to 5, and that's what's returned. Second time we call x, a is incremented to 8, and that's what's returned. Third time we call x, a of x is incremented to 11, and that's what's returned. But now when we call y, after calling x three times, y has its own separate a, which still before this first call to y, is the value 2. And so the first time we call y, its a is incremented from 2 to 5, and that's what's returned. Next time we call y, it's incremented to 8. And the third time we call y, it's incremented 11. So again, the a of x and y are totally independent. Same code, and in that sense the same function, except x and y are referencing functions with different closures, because they were created in different calls to foo. And so just continuing on here, after calling y three times, if we call x again, well, last value of a and x was 11. That gets incremented to 14. Call x one more time, it gets incremented to 17. Then if we call y, the last value of a for y was 11 back up here. Now it's being incremented to 14. Call one more time, it gets incremented to 17. So that's what we call a closure. It's a function with reference to a particular context of retained variables. And it's possible that we sometimes might have references to the same function code but those functions have different closures. So how might closures be useful? Here's one example. Say in our process example, the amount that we increment the values by, we want to be determined by something which the user inputs. So this prompt int function is going to at console, prompt the user to enter an integer, and it's gonna return that integer value, which will be stored then in val. And now this anonymous function we're passing the process, thanks to closures, it can use this variable val that's created out here. It retains access to that variable. And so when we process the slice of ints x, uh, we're incrementing it by whatever value the user entered at console. And without closures, we'd have to find another solution. And I don't know what you'd do, maybe have a global variable. Uh, whatever the solution is, it wouldn't be nearly as convenient. Last thing about closures, it's important to keep in mind that because multiple anonymous functions can be created in a single function call, like say in this call to main here, we're creating both a function stored in f and an anonymous function stored in g, both of those functions here have the same closure. They're both referencing the same variable a. So when I call f here, which is incrementing the value of a by 5, and then I call g, which increments the value of a by 2, they're both incrementing the same variable. So this call to f here is incrementing this a to 8, and this call to g is incrementing it from 8 to 10. And now when I print out a, it's the value of 10.